Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for spending your Thursday evening with us. Pardon my voice, I've lost it. Not because I was briefing him, but there's something else going on in the air. Um, so I had, being an Indian, I'm genetically dispo di disposed to getting diabetes. On top of that, I actually had my grandma who passed away as a result of diabetes, which um, went into uh, cardiovascular, I mean, heart, heart attack. So basically, what I really want to share is during that experience when she was diabetic, um, going through, bringing her for checks, Checkups at the polyclinics, and then um, walking her, giving, make, making sure she took the pill, making sure that she went on for some exercise classes that my, her friends had put together for her and all. It was not only a, a very painful experience for her, frankly, being a very um, homebound person, but also for me because you know I saw, actually saw my grandma um, going through a lot of difficulties just because she wanted to see us grow up. Very simply put, right? She, she basically had started having diabetes when I was about three years old. And, but she trashed on until I was 16 and then she passed away. Um, so that experience also taught me the importance of um, prevention. Making, diabetic, even though you are, I'm genetically susceptible, it doesn't mean that it's a, it's a fateful disease. I'm really fated to have it. Uh, a lot of studies have already shown us that if we can take the right steps, eat healthy, exercise, uh, go for regular screening, you should be able to uh, halt the progression uh, or actually retard the onset of diabetes. And not only that, um, we also know that there are a couple of other factors like obesity, besides genetic disposition that um, results in diabetes coming on, uh, coming in, coming, uh, setting on upon us. So without actually explaining a lot, because there are others who are going to be sharing with you what else, what, uh, what are the uh, vulnerable factors that results in diabetes, how can you actually prevent it, well, how is, where does Singapore exactly sit when we say about diabetes, because just last year, a war was declared, why is it so and such. So a lot, couple of my colleagues will be sharing a bit of information with you all. Um, I finally just want to say before I hand over to the rest, to Derek, to bring on the rest, uh, this is to, this designathon was truly set up to crowdsource ideas. But it doesn't mean that we can't not have fun. When you go out there, when you talk to people, um, I'm sure many of you here are seasoned design thinkers. Um, you know what it means to actually be shadowing a person and finding out what exactly works, what would exactly work in pushing them to take the right step. Uh, and so welcome on board with us and thank you once again for um, spending this evening with us. Thank you, Vasuki. Um, so as Vasuki mentioned, there's a lot of people working on the war on diabetes and uh, to share with us an overview on the war on diabetes, uh, here's Teresa from the Diabetes Program Office. Okay, hi, I'm Teresa from the Diabetes Program Office, Ministry of Health. Um, thank you again to Padang & Co and HPB for organizing today's workshop. I'll be here to give you an overview of the war on diabetes and the presenters that come after me will do a deep dive of each of the challenge statements. So why the war on diabetes? Well, a local study estimated that Singaporeans have a one in three lifetime risk for diabetes. And many Singaporeans with diabetes are either unaware of their condition or have poor control of their blood sugar levels. In 2014, we estimated that 440k Singaporeans have diabetes. And if nothing is done, this is estimated to double to close to 1 million by 2050. So what we have seen in the recent years, um, the last decade or so, is that increases in our diabetes prevalence is in large part due to population aging. But in uh, moving forward in the next decade or two, it is the increases in obesity that will drive increases in our diabetes prevalence. So you see in the last uh, couple of days, there's a Straits Times article that says that Singapore, we are currently at an inflection point. Our obesity prevalence is estimated to reach 15% in less than seven years' time. That is really um, uh, modeling what has happened in the US. So the obesity epidemic will be very important for us when we think in terms of the projected increase in diabetes prevalence in the next decade or two. Okay, so, so diabetes does not just affect the individual patient, but it has resulted in loss to the families as well as society at large. 
Um, poorly controlled diabetes can also lead to a whole host of complications, as you see on the slide here, um, such as kidney failure, heart attack, and stroke. Uh, not to mention that it can severely hamper mobility by inducing blindness and lower limb amputation. So, um, in 2014, we estimated that diabetes is the second cause of ill health and death in Singapore after ischemic heart disease. And uh, these are the risk factors for diabetes. I think they are very well elucidated. Um, family history and increased age can't be changed, but the point is this, that even with a genetic predisposition, by leading a healthy lifestyle, such as uh, healthy eating and having a, physical, a physically active lifestyle, uh, one can reduce or prevent delay, uh, and delay, uh, delay progression to diabetes. Um, there are two groups worth mentioning here. Uh, first pertains to those with impaired glucose tolerance, also known as prediabetes. So a local study estimated that one in three persons with impaired glucose tolerance is estimated to develop diabetes within eight years. Uh, another group worth mentioning are women with a history of gestational diabetes. Gestational diabetes refers to diabetes you develop when you're pregnant. So a local study showed that one in 10 women with a history of GDM will develop diabetes, type 2 diabetes, in five years. So as you can see, if you can significantly improve the detection and follow-up of this true group of persons, we can significantly halt the inflow into our diabetic cohort. And also to say that these risk factors here, uh, modifiable risk factors, are shared with other chronic conditions such as cancers, heart diseases and stroke. So by tackling diabetes, there will be collateral benefits for other chronic conditions as well. And the war on diabetes has uh, become a concrete platform for us to effect many of the healthy living initiatives that we wish to do for MOH and HPB. So this is our national strategic framework for the war on diabetes. We have three verticals cutting across the care continuum from prevention, screening to disease management. And these three verticals are underpinned by two horizontals on public education and outreach, as well as data analytics. And I'll go into further details on each of these pillars. Um, so firstly, on prevention, um, HPB has adopted a twin approach of encouraging Singaporeans to first eat right and then exercise more. On healthy, living initiat healthy eating initiatives, I would like to highlight uh, two new uh, initiatives that HPB is rolling out this year. Um, the first pertains to healthier catering guidelines, which will be adopted by public sector as well as community organisations. Um, the guidelines encourage uh, the use of more whole grains, less sugary drinks, and limit uh, deep-fried items on the menu. Um, another initiative which is happening in July this year is the Healthier Ingredient Development Scheme, which aims to encourage F&B manufacturers to innovate healthier food ingredients. Uh, on the right side of the slide, on active lifestyle, uh, National Health Survey showed that uh, a quarter of Singaporeans do not have sufficient physical activity. And our strategy is to plug into the broader national movement for exercise and sports and to inspire sporting excellence through Sports SG and Active SG. We also work very closely with other government agencies through whole of government collaborations on infrastructure enhancements, uh, such as working with NPARCs on park connectors and LTA MND on walking trails underneath the MRT, uh, MRT tracks. And uh, my colleague later will share with you that the National Step Challenge has gained very good ground traction uh, and has mobilised Singaporeans to uh, increase, uh, take small steps towards increasing their physical activity levels. Oops. Slide 13, it's not showing. Screening. Screening, okay, slight technical fault. <laughs> uh, on screening, uh, we want to also improve early detection, and early detection allows the initiation of intervention and treatment where appropriate in a timely manner. Um, so we have made screening even more affordable for Singaporeans. So you can see here in the picture, if you're a pioneer uh, generation card holder, you need not pay for your screening at Charles GP clinics. If you're a Charles card holder, you pay $2, and all other eligible Singaporeans, you pay $5. So screening is made extremely affordable at Charles GP clinics. Um, we have also bundled the co-payments such that uh, 
the $025 includes both the cost of screening tests and GB consult fees as well as the first follow-up consult if required. So by bundling both the cost of screening and follow-up, we hope to reduce the drop-off rate post-health screening. Because we found that many Singaporeans do come for screening. Our screening coverage is about above 70%. But not a lot of those with abnormal results or slightly abnormal results do follow up with a primary care provider after the health screening. So we really want to uh, strengthen follow up post health screening. Um, we have also noticed that uh, there are younger adults aged below 40 getting diabetes. So while we have used 40 as a cutoff point to flag individuals for health screening, we are noticing the need to actually expand our screening criteria to reach the younger age groups. So the diabetes risk assessment tool has been used in countries such as Finland, the UK and the US, and we are piloting a similar uh, template based on local data here. Um, this will be rolled out in September this year. Uh, and we want to say that the diabetes risk assessment tool is uh, not just for the high risk groups and to channel them for screening, but those with low risk or moderate risk uh, should continue to lead a healthy lifestyle and modify their risk factors for diabetes. And so just a, a, a last, a one of the last slides on disease management. Uh, the war on diabetes was declared because at the systems level, it also allows us to, to provide a concrete platform to rally healthcare providers to effect some of the healthcare transformation plans that MOH has. Um, so one of the key priorities for MOH is to move healthcare beyond hospital setting, beyond institutional-based care into the community anchored at the primary care level. And the solution is not just to build more polyclinics, but is to also um, harness the relatively untapped capacity of the local GPs. And GPs, as you know, they are solo practices, so, so we will need to equip them, support them uh, to provide uh, cr chronic care, better chronic care. And one way we try to do this is through the primary care network, which aims to provide ancillary services such as nursing counselling, uh, diabetic food screening and eye screening. Uh, we also will be rolling out appropriate care guides which will provide primary care doctors with guidance on oral medications for type 2 diabetes as well as the management of pre-diabetes. And uh, appropriate care guide is important because we not only want to uh, deliver quality care but also value-based care. And the last two bullet points is just to say that we have uh, flagship programs to prevent complications of the kidney and the eye. Um, I have two examples here of community projects. One is undertaken by the National Healthcare Group in collaboration with uh, PA, Health Promotion Board, the Local Residence Committee and Active SG. And another is the Health Peers Program by the Eastern Health Alliance. So these two examples really, they are a medical social model is to try to spur healthcare providers to not only think about delivering healthcare, but is to think about delivering health to the citizens in the community closer to home. Um, and I'd last like to say that um, MOH has made the war on diabetes not just a task of MOH alone, but we have tried very much to involve the whole of nation, whole of society in this fight against diabetes. And uh, as Vasuki has pointed out earlier, this designer ton is part of our broader engagement efforts to get you in touch with a public health priority that is very important to our nation. And I um, uh, hope that I hope to see active participation and good sign-up rates and I look forward to hearing, um, receiving your questions and hearing feedback from you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Teresa. Um, I saw some of you taking pictures of the slides. Uh, don't worry, we're going to stick these uh, slide decks from tonight as well as a whole lot of other resources that have been collecting from MOH, uh, HPB and other sources. Uh, in the resource folder. So all of you, when uh, you checked in just now, you received a welcome sheet and there's a link to the resource folder inside there. Just note that uh, we have actually already included a number of documents in there, uh, which would be fantastic for you to refer to um, if you are interested in, in reading more and uh, diving deeper into those topics. So, um, uh, Teresa talked about the screen for life, so you know there's there's a lot of uh, screening initiatives and penetration for screening is actually quite high. Um, it is about the sort of uh, the follow actions that we still need to do. 
Um, so, you know, to introduce the first challenge, I hope you guys have really had a, a chance to actually at least glance through this, those challenges. If not, ne never mind, we've got the next two speakers to take us through those two challenges and give us a little bit of more context and uh, insights as well as the opportunity areas and some possible uh, projects they can be working on. Um, to welcome back uh, Vasuki to talk about the uh, possible interventions, uh, programs uh, for people with high risk of uh, contracting diabetes. Vasuki. Okay, so pre-diabetics, um, Teresa spoke quite a bit about them. These are persons who are at risk of developing diabetes but not there yet. So. We have, been, at Health Promotion Board, we have been collecting stories about pre-diabetics. To be very frank with all of you, um, the term pre-diabetics in Singapore's context is relatively new. It's, it wasn't until the war on diabetes was announced, I don't think it was a term that was that well known, uh, maybe more in the medical field. Uh, but stories have been coming to us when we attend um, sessions, when we sit down in clinics and talk to patients. So. Um, Four personas I have, which um, you did not take any pictures about because it's in the slides already, but basically I just want to share some of these uh, little inklings that they are there, which predisposes these individuals as well. So if you look at Jason, um, he's in his late 20s, he's a working professional. That already means he basically eats on the run, um, doesn't really have time for exercise. Um, and even though his, when he went for screening, his doctors do tell him, hey, actually your blood glucose levels are a bit on the high side, maybe you should take care about it. He feels okay because generally he is well. Um, so that's one persona uh, that please bear this in mind. The other one is a very young, busy mother. I can relate to that. I belong to that category with three kids. Uh, in her early 30s, when she was pregnant, like what uh, Teresa was sharing, she, had, she was diagnosed to have gestational diabetes. So many, for many women, right, when, even for me, when I was pregnant, uh, thank God I didn't have gestational diabetes, but the notion of gestational diabetes is actually very temporary. Gestational itself means during gestation, right, during pregnancy. And a lot of people actually do, the, what do you call it, the blood glucose level does resume to normal after after you have given birth, but it doesn't actually mean your risk of di developing diabetes later in life uh, actually falls off, uh, disappears. In fact, in, in, there, there have been studies that show that within just 10 years, a woman with gestational diabetes can actually have full-blown diabetes if she doesn't really take care of her um, health and well-being. So there you have it, that's Aisha. Now Raymond, who, are, who is a this is a picture of uh, our very friendly bus drivers that we see. Uh, very typical of them. Uh, in their late 40s, they are working shift, long hours. They go to work sometimes at 4 a.m. in the morning, sometimes at 4 p.m., 4 p.m. sometimes even later. Um, they usually eat out, loves hawker food. And in fact, about 60% of Singaporeans love eating. Have it, we have uh, at least one meal outside on a particular day, any, any day. So, and we know that hawker food tends to be higher in salt, higher in sugar sometimes, and such, which also, again, uh, predisposes a person to do diabetes because of, simply because of the diet that uh, we consume. He also has a mother who's diabetic. So even though you see a real-life example in front of you, a mother being diabetic, going for regular checkups, it doesn't really seem to have any impact on him yet. Now, Jesslyn, a homemaker in her 50s. Yes, in Singapore, at the age of 40, you will receive a package, a gift from HPB that says, please, time for you to go for screening. But many of them don't really turn up for their screenings. Uh, but regardless, we keep chasing them every year to come and attend the screening sessions. She is of normal weight, but they have a history of hypertension. And again, as um, Teresa shared earlier, Hypertension is also another uh, leading risk factor for diabetes. So, um, she, Jasmine, typical of many homemakers, just because they are doing a lot of household chores, they always feel that um, enough exercise is being done, they may not be eating enough, they're getting enough exercise and such, don't really have to go out and do a lot of other activities, uh, but it's not necessarily the case as we have seen. So, these are four personas, very typical of a person uh, who is predisposed to di diabetes. And very typical of patients, when you are shadowing them, 
you may actually encounter many of them like this. So just want to lay the, um, lay the type of lifestyle that they're living when you're trying to think through about this challenge statement. So very, uh, this is a very medical, I think this is my only very heavily medical slide I have, which basically tells you what are the different levels for um, when we say impaired glucose tolerance. What does it mean actually? <clears throat> so two, there are basically two definitions and according to any one of definitions, when you go to a doctor, you have impaired glucose tolerance, they will actually tell you you're pre-diabetic. So. <clears throat> and there are about half a million diabetics in Singapore, pre-diabetics in Singapore, sorry, and about two in five of them will progress to diabetes over the next eight years. So this is not just a number I plugged out from the sky. Uh, this is a study by NUS that actually showed us this, uh, this is actually the case, true case now. But not all is gone. If, you, if a person who's pre-diabetic actually adopts a li healthier lifestyle, you eat, eat the right nutritionally balanced meals, um, you exercise, you go for regular screenings, the chances of progression is actually de decreases. But men, like I mentioned earlier, the four um, personas that we went through earlier, this is very typical of Singaporeans who are pre-diabetics. Basically, we don't have time. We, don't, we just eat what comes our way. We don't even sit down to have a proper meal. Yeah, we have one hour in a work day to eat, but I think most of us are eating either at our desk, desk or we are just rushing out, take a, grab a 10 minutes meal or anything that's quick and easy to be served, come back and that's it. So these things are not that easy to change, but the reality is we need to change them if we want to live a healthier lifestyle. So how do we go about doing that? Within Health Promotion Board, we actually tried to do it over the past two years. We structured a six weeks plus six weeks program. So it's six weeks of structured program and then structured program and then six weeks of uh, um, basically gave them like a tracker and asked them to go and exercise, set their own goals and such. So that's the six plus six. And these are examples of people who actually went through the program, worked very closely. Thank you to, I don't think, I believe we do have colleagues from National Healthcare Group Polyclinics and Sing Health Polyclinics who actually helped to channel some of your patients to us. Thank you. So yeah, this is the explanation of what happens. So, um, so there's a regular follow-up, a monthly SMS that's also sent to the to the client to basically remind them about some of the goals that they've set alongside with us, um, that how they can come out and participate in our other activities that HPB has, especially those exercise classes like Sundays at the Park, um, Sunrise in the City. And then at 12 man, they come back for an oral glucose tolerance test, which is a gold standard test to see whether a person has progressed or um, retarded the progression to diabetes. So basically what we've noticed, oh, we don't have the results, sorry. But we do, we do know that among a pilot that was done with only about 50 persons or so, numbers are small and that's another challenge that we face. Um, the results were actually very encouraging. About three in four actually managed to retard any progression in their blood um, glucose levels. So this pilot is actually now being scaled up and we are looking at getting more persons to come on board as well as tweaking some of the elements of this program to make it a lot more palatable for our clients. So one aspect of how we make it palatable is basically through an online app. So many of us, you know, we, I, um, just now we shared, right, 18 to 39 is when um, you are actually, the risk may not be that high, but you do know if you, have, if you are pre-diabetic. But we are all very busy. So how do we get them? Everybody is basically stuck on your phone in one way or another. Me too. I was checking emails, uh, my emails just now. So why not use an app? Use the phone that's always with you to actually get you to look at changing your behavior as well. Um, so that's what we did. We came up with this <coughs> health up track, which has a diabetes prevention track. There are many others inside there. There's a smoking cessation track, a healthy pregnancy track, etc. But basically, it provides a customized recommendation. You put in your, depending on which level you are at, which status of life you are at, you put in the uh, respective goal, you put in what you want to do, and it pushes out relevant recommendations for you for at least a period of three months. Three months is basically because everything that we do in Health Promotion Board, if you do notice, usually it's about a, for about 12 weeks because that's basically the science, the science behind that that says anything you do for 12 weeks after that becomes a habit. So the habituation of, uh, of a new behavior. So it's a very friendly color, as you can see, lovely purple. Yeah, I'm sure there's some behavior insights that went into white purple too. And um, ah, there it is. So 
this is, this is an example of what actually happened when we were doing the program with the polyclinics or the GPs. We screened about, um, so this, this is the basic number of who were screened. Those who had abnormal results, so these are persons with impact glucose tolerance. Um, out of which about 1%, less than 1% expressed interest to participate in our program. But of course, we also have to check eligibility and uh, about 53% actually came on. And um, of that, those who are eligible, we could only recruit 27 of them. So the basic, um, the basic idea I want to put through is there may be many out there who are predisposed, but we do not easily get them into our program. Also because of the structure of the program, it's too in intensive, it requires you to uh, go out of your way to do things. So something to think about when you are looking at um, the challenge statement that's going to come up. Another issue that we want to look at is retention. So you can, maybe it's easy to get a person on a program, but keeping them on a program is another challenge that we are facing. So how exactly can we go about uh, getting them to stay on our programs? It's only a six weeks program. It doesn't really take too much of your time, but that's what we all think, but it's not true. A six week means one hour at least spent doing something that you may not be interested in doing really. So how do you exactly get them to then come on board with us? Um, we also, this is our own, um, when we were sitting down and looking at the program, we actually realized there was actually no mechanism to actually put, to really follow up with them. Just because a person comes back for one week and you have another seven months of SMS doesn't mean that you're actually following up with them. Um, there, there, we do another program with overweight children in the school and we realize that when just getting a counts, a school, a, what we call a health coach, to just call up the kid and say, hey, how are you doing? Oh, uh, how has your day been, etc." actually motivates the child to want to do something about their weight, uh, their weight status. And the science behind it, or not the science, but when I was talking to some of the students who actually received this phone call, they were actually telling me that, you know, I'm overweight, nobody really cares about me. But when I have this person, even though it's an older person, calling me up and check, just checking, out, me, checking me out, I don't mind actually doing something that boosts um, this confidence that a person has in me. So um, from another program, something I learned that I just want to share with this team here. Okay. So um, these are the challenge statements that we want you all to think about. And um, so some of the solutions that we have been exploring back in HPB is listed there, the two points, uh, coming out of a toolkit that can be simply given to a GP to be given to the patient, or um, a campaign, a marketing tactic to actually tell people, you know, pre-diabetic is actually a condition, a health medical condition that you should be paying attention about, and uh, here's what you can do. So again, raising the, alert, uh, the awareness among people to actually do something about their lifestyle. So, um, any other information that you need, it's in the toolkit. I think there will also be mentors around later who can actually share a bit more about what we uh, encounter when the program is being run in, the, in our HBB settings. So, oh, sorry, that's another one. Uh, how might we empower? It's actually a similar question to that, but this is more about empowering the pre diabetes to take charge of the condition and halting the progression. So, not many of them, we acknowledge not many of them will want to go for a structured program, but how can we then uh, work with the pre-diabetics to, yeah, to state what's there, to take charge, change their lifestyle habits. And um, so some of the solutions that we were exploring and we would like you to come on board with us is stated there as seen. All right, thank you. Thank you, Basuki. Um, so, um, she's uh, shared with you some personas. Um, so, you know, in, in other words, there's a lot of different types of people that you can be designing these programs for. Um, a lot of uh, different types of marketing tactics or, you know, ways of um, actually getting people to enroll themselves and stay on track uh, with their intervention programs. So, lots of, lots of uh, opportunities for you to think about. Um, next to, um, I'm, I'm sure the uh, personas in the next uh, presentation are actually really, really familiar with, uh, to you because you are, most of you actually are the targets of this. Um, to introduce the uh, second challenge, increasing f level of physical activities among working adults. This is from uh, HPB. Okay, good evening everyone. 
Let's talk about physical activity. Can I just do a quick check? How many of you here exercise regularly? Okay, this is a bias group. Okay. <laughs> Okay, let's carry on. I'll show you some of the information that we have had so far that, uh, and highlight some of the challenges that we have and we really look forward to the solutions that are coming from you. First of all, what is physical activity? To put it in very simple terms, physical activity means movement of the body that uses energy. So any form of movement, sports and exercise, walking, commuting, moving up and down the stairs, we categorize them under the whole umbrella of physical activity. So two broad categories. First, incidental physical activity. When you leave your house and you walk to the train station, when you go up the stairs, two flights of stairs to, to your office, those are considered incidental physical activity. Leisure time physical activity refers to a deliberate attempt at structured exercise programs that you go and do it uh, with friends, with social groups, or by yourself. So those are largely the sports and exercise that we talk about. So th that is uh, leisure time physical activity. So there are some uh, physical activity recommendations. Uh, according to the World Health Organization, uh, the recommendation is 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity or 75 minutes of vigorous intensity or a combination of both. Okay. Um, this Recommendations will bring about health benefits. It reduces the risk of chronic diseases, uh, prolonged life, enhanced quality of life, and HPB adopts similar guidelines uh, for the population. Okay, so we encourage people to sit less, break up your sedentary time, stop sitting like four or five hours or eight hours throughout the day when we, we are at work, increase the amount of opportunities for you to walk using the stairs instead of the lift. Hi alighting one bus stop before your house and then walking the rest of the distance home. And of course, we encourage people to play, ex uh, play sports and do more exercise in their free time. So at, at HPB level, we do a lot of monitoring of the population levels, physical activity, uh, the amount of physical activity that is done by, by population, mainly through national surveys. And these are largely self-reported uh, uh, information that we gather from the population. And I'm going to show you some of the findings that we have from this information collected. First of all, let's look at this uh, slide. So, uh, a lot of information there, but I just want to bring your attention to a few key things. So, this is, this is information collected from our school health survey and health behavior surveillance survey. If you look at the graph, where is it? Okay. The blue line is total physical activity. So, and green is incidental, red is leisure time. We, we notice that there is a decrease in physical activity at, at a few age bands within the population. Let's look at the male population first. 17 to 18 years old, 21 to 24 years old, and 25 to 39 years old. We are suspecting some of the reasons that can lead to this uh, decrease in physical activity. 17 to 18 years old, the age where you move from a mainstream school to polytechnics, or IHLs, we call it, or, or ITEs, where there are no longer structured, regular PE classes. Then we begin to see that the physical activity levels drop. 18 to 20, a lot of the guys are in NS. Very high level of physical activity. Leaving NS, going into the workforce, going to universities, it drops. Then when you when you are between 25 to 39 years old, we are thinking that these are the years where you start to build your career. You start to set up your own family, you go into parenthood. Priorities change. You're after your career, you need to look after your family, you always say that you have no time to exercise. And this is showing in the information that we have been collecting. Next, the females. Similar trend, but females do not have NS. Lah. So once they drop, ah, they continue to drop. First of all, same thing, moving from structured uh, mainstream schools to uh, polytechnics, motherhood, very significant drop. And you notice that for both male and females, what happens after 39 years old in terms of your physical activity level stays pretty much stable. So how do we then make sure that they don't drop so much? 
And by the time they are hitting their late 30s, the physical activity habit seems to be sustaining throughout their lifetime. So how do we bring this curve up throughout the rest of their lives for sustained regular physical activity? This is also supported by data from Sports Singapore. So Sports Singapore does the, annual, the, the regular sports index where they survey the participation levels for sports and exercise. So the participation rate for, for, for the population married with kids and working full-time is only 49%. Okay, not a lot. That means half of us, almost half of us who are parents or who are working are actually not doing sports and exercise. Okay, this is another key data, key piece of data that is supporting the, 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 the reason why we put this up as a challenge. HPB does a lot of programs, physical activity programs. Uh, I'm sure you have heard of National Steps Challenge. How many of you are participants of our National Steps Challenge? Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> but you, you guys must have heard of it, okay? So, so maybe we'll get the information and we know where to go to recruit all of you for the next season, okay? So National Steps Challenge use technology. So we tap on, like what Vasuki mentioned, we are always on our phone. So we actually have an application, the Healthy365 app that helps uh, participants to clock in their steps. Of course, we give out the free steps tracker where you can wear and you can track the number of steps and we give, we reward people by giving uh, vouchers. So we have a few of these here. Uh, later on, we're, we're not giving out, we're not giving out today. So, but you can, can have a look at it, you can have a play with it, but I guess you guys are familiar with the wearable technology today. Okay, so um, we have the tracker, we have the app, and then we gamify the whole National Steps Challenge, trying to encourage people to walk uh, more throughout the day. Okay, we give out small little vouchers, uh, five, ten dollars NTUC vouchers, and we are very encouraged to see that the response has been very good so far. We have had two seasons, and half a million of Singaporeans are on board. Okay, uh, so, and then this application provides a platform for HPB to talk to our, our population uh, on a regular basis because we collect the information about uh, the number of steps you take, we are able to send you notification to nudge you along the way, to encourage you to take a few more steps every day. So that's, that's the, the thinking behind the National Steps Challenge. Despite the programs that we are running, there are obviously challenges based on the, the stats that I've shown earlier that you have seen. So clearly, when people are transiting from one life stage to another, moving from school to work, or work to parenthood, there are significant drops in their physical activity level. And we also know that it really doesn't help that 43% of our workforce sit eight hours every day at work. And we also know from literature, and it's well documented, that being physically inactive increases your risk of diabetes and obesity, which is a huge risk factor of diabetes as well. And we hear very common excuses or reasons, if you want to put it that way. Work commitments, you have no time for it, you're too lazy, you, you, you just, you're just too tired, you're not interested in doing sports and exercise. While we are seeing some encouraging results from, by encouraging, encouraging people to just sit less and walk a little bit more, but there is also a need for us to increase the intensity of the physical activity that, that people are doing to, to get that kind of uh, health benefits because the recommendation is actually moderate intensity and vigorous intensity or a mixture of both. Okay, so we are trying to get the inactive people to start by taking steps, walking more, and then for more people to then gradually move to being more active to, uh, in sports and exercise. So there are some other programs that we do that are targeted in the workplace. So the location where these programs are happening will be near areas with a high concentration of offices and workplace. For example, we have a running program called iRun. So on a weekly basis, we have lots of people coming together and running as a group. And we have Sunrise in the City, a very popular studio-based, gym-based program that happens early in the morning before the start of the workday, and fitness at work. Group aerobic sessions happening at uh, areas where, where uh, the CBD areas. So all these programs are free of charge. So, and we have seen quite good participation numbers. So based on the information we collected the first three quarters of 2016, the average num the total number of participants coming through to our programs are in the thousands. And we're talking about 
all three programs at together, we have about 70 over sessions per week. And we noticed from our attendance data collected, on average, each participant participates X number of sessions with, with Sunrise in the city having the highest, highest uh, number, average number of sessions attended. We are thinking it was also because it is a gym-based setting. So shower facilities are available for use after that and it's weatherproof. Even if it rains, the program can carry on. Whereas sometimes running programs and fitness at work, the aerobics program may happen in outdoor areas where you, it's affected by weather. The haze, for example, and rain, of course. Okay. So, um, this may not be very surprising for a lot of you. More, our programs attract predominantly the females. So, where are the guys? Where are the guys? So, we see them more in Iran. It's a good split. And the rest, overwhelmingly females. And we notice that Iran and Sunrise in the City attract a younger participation crowd. Probably because of the higher intensity of the program. Okay? But yes, we have a problem attracting males to our programs today. So there are other efforts that we try to reach out to the males. Okay, we, we piloted the active men workout. And in four weeks, participation increased by more than 100%. Okay, because based on our focus group discussions, based on, based on when we go on the ground and talk to some of our participants, we realize that what we hear is the guys actually prefer customized programs, higher intensity, more challenging programs. Okay, we also had customized running clinics and high intensity classes at workplaces. And the, the feedback is positive and we are seeing good uh, participation rates. The competitive nature in, in guys, okay. So we started introduce programs with competitive elements and we are exploring maybe collaboration with Sports SG to uh, organize some sports leagues uh, at, at the workplace level to attract more men on board. And recently we did another little social cohesion ex experiment. And then we realized that when you are close to people in the exercise group, you tend to stay together and exercise for a more, on a more regular basis. Okay, so, so we think that uh, one of the key strategy for us to encourage regular participation could then be building this um, social cohesion among the, the participants in the program. Maybe something to think about when you guys are doing all the ideation for the challenge statements. So, a uh, quick recap on the problem statement. So, we want to encourage working adults to be more physical, physically active through exercise and sports. Okay, so we looked at it from, a two, from, from two components. First, the program design. How do we design the program and implement it such that it is appealing to the working adults? Do we need uh, more innovative ways to implement the programs? Is, is tracking the way to go? Are people motivated and encouraged when they are able to track their own progress. What about young families? Can, would they prefer to exercise together as a family with their young kids? So these are some of the things that we are thinking of. So apart from the program design, the other area that we think that we possibly want to tackle is the intrinsic motivation of people wanting to do sports and exercise regularly. So how do we, how do, we do that? Should we encourage more forming of social interest groups where friends, colleagues come together and exercise? Or should we think, of, think out of the box new and innovative programs that, that, that is appealing to the younger working adults perhaps? Or use more me uh, mechanisms that incorporate incentives, incentivizing them to get them to start doing it and then sustaining on, the, on, on their own later on. So these are the few areas that we're thinking of. Okay, so that's all I have. So we look forward to uh, more ideas coming from you guys. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kenix. Um, this all reminds me of uh, something that I read uh, one of my favorite newspaper columnists uh, wrote before. Try, uh, try explaining jogging on the treadmill to an Ethiopian. Um, 
it's just, you know, it's the facts of modern life. You know, we, we, we have uh, these, um, but, you know, with the appropriate behavioral change mechanisms, maybe we can uh, make the change. And speaking of that, um, um, on the topic of behavioral change, you know, runs through the, both, both challenges. And I can't think of a better person to introduce uh, the topic of behavioral change than Samuel from Behavioral Insights team. Thank you, Derek. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, so my name's Sam, I'm from the Behavioral Insights team. We're a small social policy consulting firm, originally from London, just opened an office here in Singapore. I, I appear not to have any slides. Oh, there we go. A bit worried there. Um, okay, so I'm gonna talk to you about um, what drives behavioral change for better health outcomes. I've got some health-related slides here. However, I am not a health policy expert. I'm a social scientist, I work across lots of different areas of government policy, thinking where you have a specific behavioral challenge, there's something you want people to do, how do you get people to do it? And I'm gonna to present to you some of the research, most of it's not ours, but it's stuff that we find interesting, that I think will help to start give you some principles that might help with the design challenges you have ahead of you. So I'm gonna skip this given the time constraints and just talk a little bit more about behavior. So one of the core principles of the um, behavioral economics and psychology, which are the two areas we draw lots of our work from, um, is that there are essentially two models of decision-making and behavior. Two different ways that the mind works, two different um, ways of thinking about the decisions that you and everyone around us makes. And the uh, um, Nobel Prize winning psychologist, Daniel Kahneman, he came up with this model. Anybody here read the book, Thinking Fast and Slow? This is from his book and from his research. But it's easy to uh, conceptualize the way that the mind works, the way that decisions work, and the way that behaviors happen as being from these two different systems. Um, he named system one, system two. So if you imagine that system one is your fast thinking and effortless system, what that really means is the bits of your brain that control your behavior when you're doing something that is routine or automatic. The example there is, I think, a very good one. If I asked everybody in this room to do the mathematics uh, problem or um, sum of two multiplied by two. Nobody does any multiplication. Nobody in this room would do any multiplication at all, as if by some kind of magic in a puff of smoke, the answer just appears in your head. You know what the answer is already. That's your automatic system. And it's responsible for a much larger proportion of the behavior than most people think. So if you imagine your commute, let's say you drive to work, most people don't think about where to go, or in fact, sometimes don't do any system two thinking for an entire drive, sometimes half an hour or an hour. System two, to contrast, is your slow thinking and deliberate system. If again, I ask you the math sum 24 times 17, nobody here has the magic answer in their head. At least I think not, although Singaporean math scores are a lot better than British ones. Um, instead, you have to do some hard thinking, right? You might need a pen and paper, it takes a while, it feels effortful to do so. Similarly, if you're planning a trip overseas to compare to the commute, again, um, you need to do some hard thinking. It's not easy, it's not automatic. Now the reason this is an interesting and useful distinction is because very often when we're trying to do social policy interventions, trying to get people to do something differently, we rely upon changing their system too. Their motivation, their thought processes, trying to make something, them kind of actively commit to do something. However, what we know is actually there's a load of untapped stuff in system one and system one's actually responsible for a much greater proportion of our routine behaviors than you might imagine. It's a little bit about Daniel Kahneman. And one of the things I'm gonna talk about today is about these environmental effects. So he says, turns out the environmental effects on behavior are a lot stronger than most people expect, and that is because you can very strongly influence someone's system one in the moment. Just quickly on the size of the challenge, I know we've already had a bit about this already, but uh, this is some data from the, uh, it's a global study in fact, but this is from the UK data showing what are the things that lead to loss of life in the UK? What are all of the different things that lead to loss of life? And if you look from the top to the bottom, the vast majority of the ones that have a big impact are all behavioral. They're all preventable things that people do that shorten lives. Diet, smoking, high blood pressure, of course, related to diet, being overweight, physical inactivity, alcohol, cholesterol. And you get quite far down, occupational risks, I guess would be the first one, where it's something that isn't easily preventable, supposing that people always followed through on actions that they wanted to do. So, 
In terms of, I've got three principles for you today, and this is the first one. Um, and I think it's a super important one when you think about the different things that we might uh, do to change behavior, is first to understand that we do not know our own behavior. This is true of everybody. Um, if I asked everybody in this room to put their hand up and tell me the exact number of minutes they exercise on an average week, no one would be able to answer that question accurately. Um, and even if you are using a pedometer or some other measurement device, typically there'll be many things about your behavior that that cannot capture. Of course, those things are getting more and more sophisticated, which is good, but it's a simple rule. People don't know their own behavior. They don't remember it, or they may even not have noticed it at the time. Here's some evidence to suggest this. So this is a study, uh, I believe, from the, this is from the UK, which compares survey response to accelerometer data for how much physical activity people do. So if you ask people how much physical activity you do in a nationally representative survey, this is the number of people who, based on their own self-report, meet the minimum recommendation for physical activity. So they meet the minimum level. This number of people say, I do this many minutes, and that min number of minutes is over the minimum. So 40% for men, roughly, and 30% for women. If you put pedometers on people, again, nationally representative, rather than just the people who are willing to buy pedometers, this is the data. Now, what I'm not suggesting, by the way, is that people lie. That might be part of the issue, but it's not that simple. People overestimate, or they just remember the one day where they did a bit more exercise, or you know, even that they uh, have convinced themselves that they do more than they actually do. But this is true across all behaviors. It's not just exercise, it's everything. If you ask people uh, you know, how many miles they typically drive, and it's, a, um, it's in a context where driving less would be considered better, Let's say you were just having a discussion about environmentally friendly behaviors, and you say, oh, how many miles do you drive in a typical day or in a typical year? Again, people would dramatically underestimate the number. And it, they're not typically lying. It's not a conscious thing where they're trying to mislead you. Here's another thing about um, people not knowing their own behavior. This is a really excellent study. If you had an unhealthy meal, in this case, it's a Big Mac meal. I know that's not a Big Mac. It's a Big Mac meal. And you ask people, how many calories are in this meal? They guess 870, sorry, they guess 1,085, the perceived calories, the actual calories is 870. So with a Big Mac meal, most people think it is actually more calorific than it actually is. Interesting. In fact, their perceived calories are 25% higher than the real calories. If you give something that appears healthy, and in this case, it's a cheese baguette that they used. And you ask somebody how many calories in it, they think there's 779 in this particular case on average, whereas the actual calories are much higher. So not only is it that something like physical exercise, where we should be able to very easily know the data, we get it wrong, and we underestimate how, uh, overestimate how much activity we do. With food as well, or with most other things, subtle cues in what you do change what uh, Soft cues in the environment change what people perceive. So the fact that a Big Mac is just considered unhealthy makes people overrate the number of calories, and the healthy meal underrate the calories by about a third. And so people end up eating something like this and think, I had a very healthy meal today, even though actually, in this particular instance, they would have been better off with a Big Mac meal, in terms of calories anyway. And um, there's really, really cool studies here. If you show somebody a Big Mac meal and say how many calories are in it, and you show somebody else a Big Mac meal with a side salad and ask them how many calories are in that, people guess lower when you add a side salad. So obviously, unless a salad has negative calories, which of course it does not, that is not possible. So we don't know our own behavior. Again, like I say, true across all kinds of different policy domains, not just healthy behaviors, but one I think relevant to today. Second, contextual cues make a big difference. Now, what I really mean about this, when I say this, is that in the moment when you've decided to do something or not do something, or in the moment you walk past, let's say, a restaurant or a place to eat, there are small things about that choice environment, so about the choices in front of you, how they're displayed, which choices they are, which influence your behavior. So what that means is somebody who's typically a healthy person if you put them in a different context, may behave in a way that is very unhealthy, and vice versa. But someone that's normally a very healthy person, in a different context, may behave in a way that is very healthy. 
So here are some examples. Um, this is one of my favorites, but it's a marketing thing everyone knows about. Everyone knows if you put something at the end of an aisle in a supermarket, people will buy more of them than if you put it in the middle of an aisle. Does that make sense? So you put it at the end, not in the long bit, but at the end of an aisle in a supermarket, the number of purchases go up. And a lot of uh, people who sell consumer products, they pay the supermarket to be able to put their products at the end of the aisle because they want people to buy them. And this is the impact of putting it at the end of the aisle. So for beer, people buy 23% more if you put it at the end of the aisle. For wine, 34%. And in fact, carbonated drinks are one of the highest. So sweet drinks, right at the end of the aisle, you get 52% more purchases. Now the reason that's relevant to us is because what it shows is things like carbonated drinks are a bit of an impulse purchase, at least for some people. People hadn't written down, I must go and get you know, some Coca-Cola and some lemonade. They maybe didn't have that on their list at all. They show up and just because it's at the end of the aisle, they buy it and they buy more. There are lots of studies that show different kinds of you know, ways that things are discounted or bundled together equally has a disproportionate effect on impulse purchases and often those are unhealthy things, not healthy things. No one ever buys a salad on an impulse, right? You wouldn't say, oh, you're so impulsive. You got that salad. And now here's another one that's really excellent. So everybody here, of course, has been to Starbucks. They have these three sizes, tall, grande, vente. They actually have short as well, but they don't advertise it, which is a smaller cup. And in the US, they introduced this new size, Trenta. You seen this? It's huge. It's like a, I don't know, maybe, I think it's approaching a liter of coffee. It's big. It's very big. And of course, if that coffee that you order is one of those ones with syrup and a lot of milk in, that is a lot of calories that you can just guzzle down in one go. And um, the interesting thing is, some academics looked at what happens if you add this coffee to the menu. So the first thing is, very, very few people buy it. You'll be pleased to know. Almost nobody buys the really big one. Who wants a coffee that big? Nobody. What happens, though, is people who used to buy a grande start buying a venti. People that used to buy a tall coffee start buying a grande. Because they're not actually deciding, I want this many milliliters of coffee. No one thinks like that. They just think, I want a medium. I'll get the middle one. And so if you add options to the top, it moves everybody up the chain. And everybody starts ordering something bigger. Um, I imagine if Starbucks reduced the size of every single coffee that they sell by about 10 or 20%, nobody would even notice. They wouldn't even notice. To, and so they certainly wouldn't complain. Because people just order relative to other things. And so something like this, just a change in the menu, dramatically changes what people do. It's worth saying, if you remove the smallest, that also has a pretty big impact. People, again, move up. They order even bigger. And Starbucks knows this. They did not include this coffee size because they thought it was what people wanted. They know nobody wants this massive coffee. But it moves everybody else up. Just another small thing about contextual information. This is a study that we actually did. Is there are ways you can use this to your advantage? So those previously were some examples of things which are not great about how contextual information can influence people. You know, end of our placements for a soft drink makes you buy it. Changing in the menu on the coffees makes you buy a big one. Here's something we added in a, in a supermarket. And we did it as an experiment. So we compared days where these labelings were present and days where they were not. And we compared the choice of beverage that people made when they were buying a drink. One of the great things about this is very often we express the... Uh, unhealthiness, perhaps, of something like a soft drink in terms of calories. That's not actually necessarily that easy a unit for people to juggle. Of course, if they have some app or something to do so, it's a bit more straightforward. However, instead what we did is said, this is how much exercise you have to do to burn off this drink. So if you're going to drink this juice, 500 mils of juice, I know it's water in the picture, but this is where the sign was, it, just when we went in to take the photo. If you're going to drink a juice, you have to walk for 37 minutes just to burn off that one drink that you could drink in 30 seconds. Um, and you'd have to run for 15. These numbers are reasonably accurate. It obviously depends on your own per your weight. The heavier you are, the less you have to run or walk to burn off a certain number of calories. Just like you to imagine for a second, if you uh, have children, 
they obviously weigh a very small amount relative to adults. So my son, he's very young, but he weighs 13 kilograms. He can drink 500 mils of juice in one go. In order to burn off that number of calories, he'd probably have to run for like four hours, solid. So you do have to do a lot of exercise for calories. It's kind of flipping it out. Has anyone ever run on a treadmill that tells you how many calories you've burned? You run for like 30 minutes and you look down, it's one of the most crushing and disappointing things in the world. <laughs> when you look down at it, it's like, you've burned 18 calories. <laughs> Been here for half an hour. Um, and um, given that that, is, that ratio of exercise to calories burnt is so unforgiving, why not flip it around and use it to your advantage? So use it at the calories consumed point and show You've got to do a lot of exercise if you want to burn off these. Just here are the numbers. These are the proportion of people who uh, essentially were buying unhealthy drinks, drinks with high sugar content, without the labels and with the labels. So we didn't completely change the world, but at least we encouraged some people to choose something more healthy. And just from some other study we did, that's similar to increasing the price of sugary drinks by 20%. But all that we did was we didn't change the price, we just added a little bit of information. So the second one, contextual cues make a big difference. Now the third, now we often talk about good intentions. Um, I am actually not a particularly uh, strong advocate of trying to change people's intentions because I think it often doesn't work. Partly because of all these contextual things in your environment, they interfere with your good intentions. Um, and um, I'm just going to give you an example of when they can work. A very cleverly designed thing. So in the UK, almost every single um, young person, and indeed most schools are pushing for it, they eat the kind of school meals in the cafeteria when they're at school. They don't bring their own lunch. And most schools want kids to do that because actually it show, the evidence shows that lunch brought from home is much more unhealthy than lunch at school. Um, it might often be things like sandwiches or something like that that seems healthy, but the sizes of the lunches are normally much bigger than what the school would give you. So we want kids to eat lunch at school. And um, in this particular area in the UK, they implemented a pre-ordering system. So instead of saying to the kid when they arrive at the cafeteria at lunchtime, what would you like to eat? They and their parents, at the beginning of each week, have to get a little form and they tick exactly which foods they want to eat. And they cannot change their mind when they show up. Now the reason this is really good is uh, it's there's some really great experimental evidence that we're here with me today that shows if, if you, we'd asked all of you today, a week ago, would you, we're going to have some snacks, would you prefer a banana or some cake? You can only have one. Lots of people, at least when this has been studied before, would say banana. Maybe not everybody, but loads of people would say, I'd have a banana, I'll have a banana on uh, Thursday night. When that's been studied before, if you then say when people arrive, oh, sorry, we forgot what everybody wanted. What was it that you said you wanted? In the moment, when the cake's right there, everybody lies and changes their mind. <laughs> everybody says cake, and they eat the cake. Now this uses evidence like that to say, okay, well how do you stop people from, in the moment, changing their mind? So you say, okay, you've used your long-term self, your system too, when you're thinking about what you want, when you're not necessarily hungry right now, to decide what you want, and then you lock them in, such that when they get there, they cannot change their mind. Here are the results. Percentage of students who choose a healthy lunch doubles when you pre-order. Doubles. So here are the three principles. Uh, we don't know our own behavior. Contextual cues make a big difference. And good intentions can work when they can overcome these cues. I'd just like to leave you with a thought, which is that um, some academics also did research around how many food-related decisions a person has to make in a given day. How many food-related decisions? They find the average person who lives in a big city, somewhere like Singapore, it's in the millions. There are so many possible options around you at all times. The restaurants you walk past, um, things in the shops that you go to, you know, even in your workplace, there might be snacks, there'll be drinks that you can have. There are so many moments where you can choose to eat or drink more. And the problem is, you know, if you can consider our ancestors, who, you know, maybe they were doing something like farming, they did not have that problem. So they probably didn't have that much food to start with. Then not only that, there's only really food available for you to do something with, to eat at certain mealtimes. If you're out in a field working, you're not going to eat the grain of the wheat while you're harvesting it. 
There's no food there for you to eat. There's nothing for you to eat. When you get back home, maybe at dinner time, then there's something for you to eat. So it's not like it's wearing you down, all these decisions. Whereas for a modern person, there are a huge number of organizations that make a profit from you buying their food. That might not even be unhealthy food. It might just be more food. And um, they bombard you constantly with information and with choices. And it's not just easy to blame corporations, right? Not just them. It might even be our own selves. We leave food out in our homes, in our offices. And as a result, you're constantly having to face temptation. And if we know that we're not very good at fighting temptation, one of the things about this final point is find a way to eliminate it rather than find a way to resist it. Thanks. Thank you, Sam. If, if you could s s stay there, Sam, I'm going to ask Teresa Vasuki and Ken X and Sam now to take some questions. Nice to see you. Thank you very much. While we set up the very complicated seating arrangements, you can think about the questions that uh, have been burning in your minds as these excellent presenters have uh, shared with us over the last little while. So, hand in the air, who wants to be first? If no one goes first, ah, at the back. Microphone coming to you, sir. Hi, two questions, one for Vasuki. Uh, you mentioned in the screening, uh, there was a 70% incidence of people coming in and getting screened, but there is a huge drop in uh, follow-up activities. Are there any observations that you could share on why that is? That's my first question. And the second question to Kenex is, uh, you said in, so there was a 500,000 participation or the total number of participants in the National Steps Challenge. Uh, was there any study done on are these people who were already healthy or had some sort of active lifestyle or was this across? Are there any observations on that that you can share? Thank you. Thanks for your question. So um, what we noticed when we were talking to the participants was also that the structure of the program. Uh, it was, because it was done in a polyclinic setting, the timing didn't really suit their lifestyles. I mean, many of them were working it out, so you can't really expect them to come and participate in a program at about 4 o'clock. Usually that's when the polyclinic is relatively quieter. Um, and the other, um, the other factor was the length of time. So some, some persons, uh, some of the clients actually shared with us that um, I, maybe for me it's just my food. I don't really need to go for an exercise program or um, I don't see a need to go for either one or I don't need a, a, a need to go for goal setting classes because I know how to set goals for myself and such. So those were some of the, we didn't really, to be very frank, we didn't really sit down and talk to persons who didn't stay on the program because it was quite difficult to get them back. But based on what we heard from those, um, from their friends and all, this is, these are some of the information that we could gather. Um, okay, so to be very frank, even when a, a doctor, a doctor, when they look at a pre-diabetic number, when you, know, when, you, when you go for screening, a doctor explains to you the number, if it's anywhere off, they will usually just tell you, oh, it's a bit off the scale, but you know, it's actually okay, you can just continue with it, continue with your lifestyle as it is. So the advice that's given, we have noticed, may not exactly push a person to take the next step. And we also know that, frankly, um, at it's when you are sitting in front of a doctor and whatever a doctor tells you because you're not really an, an expert in your knowledge can actually push a person to make that right, I mean that health decision. So that's the reason why we were looking at the toolkits to be given to the GPs. So uh, that's just, just one, ex one reason why. The other reason is also because even if my blood glucose level is a bit off, um, I feel fine. Maybe it's just, you know, the night before I had something which basically spiked my blood level, my blood glucose level, it's no, no big deal. So the importance, as I was uh, mentioned earlier, the importance of this stage known as pre-diabetes until the war on diabetes was actually pronounced. 
nobody actually understood what it meant. And many of the participants, I mean the clients who we um, recruited into the program, were actually um, went through the screening some years ago. They were not just going through the screening just because we had that program. Can I just ask a question before? Sam, that kind of approach of thinking, well, it's not relevant for me or I'm just a little bit bad, does that map against your framework in some way, you know, your three questions of, you know, why I sort of fool myself by saying I, I'm not really too bad? Can you see a way that we can sort of map that across that sort of behaviour? Uh, great question, Adam. Um, I think what we don't want to do, of course, is... Uh, be unnecessary, use unnecessary shock tactics, right? So um, you don't want to be telling someone the situation for them is worse than it actually is. Um, however, um, of course, it, exactly as you outlined, it's a kind of psychological defense mechanism, right? People tell you something's wrong, you don't really want to believe it. Yeah. Um, especially if the reason for that is you. Yeah. Um, so if somebody says, if a doctor says, you know, you, there's some issue that you couldn't have predicted and had nothing to do with your own behavior, people are obviously much more willing to accept that than if it's something that directly is a consequence of what they do. Um, with regards to what to do about it, that's a bit of a trickier question. Um, I think the, you know, showing that other people like them in their condition have suffered and also other people like them in their condition have done something about it are both useful tactics I would, approach, I would use in that kind of situation. I mean, I think the you'll always have that reluctance by people to engage. Um, I think one of, the, one of the wider points from, from my talk, I think, is just that all that you want, to, you want to change that person's context, not necessarily convince them. So if they don't agree that they need to change much, that might not make them that atypical. In fact, even the person that says, yes, okay, I'll do something, they're probably not that different. Right. Um, really, what you need to do is find something in the moment or get them to change their context so they do something. A good example is, you know, getting someone motivated to go for a run, not a very good predict predictor of whether they'll do it or not. Getting them to put their trainers and their running gear by the end of their bed, that works. Yeah, no, I, I actually can speak to that one, I know. If I've got my kid out from the night before and I have it there on Saturday morning, I'm more inclined to go for the run on Saturday morning than if the last thing on Friday night I don't get it out. I mean, it's that simple. Sorry, Kenix, I cut across you. Yeah, National Steps Challenge. Um, in order to make the sign-up process for National Steps Challenge as easy as possible, we only asked one question uh, related to activity levels for everyone when they sign up for the challenge. So the question was, in the last seven days, how many minutes of physical activity did you do? So the results we got from the participants actually is quite similar to what we see at a population level. <clears throat> In the National Health Survey 2010, we have already achieved about 60% of the population being physically active, sufficiently physically active, uh, defined by the 150 minutes recommendation based on self-report. So we are seeing a similar um, proportion uh, in the National Steps Challenge being a, a broad-based program and having a, a few hundred thousand uh, participants uh, on board. Yeah. So at the end of the challenge, we did make some phone calls and some checks to check in with people again on their activity levels. And we are actually, the, the reason why I mentioned that we were very encouraged by the results was also the fact that when we checked back with some of these participants, those people who previously reported that they were not that active actually increased their activity levels. Yeah, but whether that activity levels is, it, it came from walking or it came from sports and exercise, uh, that information, we don't have it to that detail at this moment, yeah. Next question. One on this side of the room. Nope. Yeah, so thank you very much for the, uh, the share of data tonight. Um, additional information that I would think very helpful for me personally is to understand what are some of the social costs related to diabetics in Singapore. Uh, so any of the panelists may have information with regards to things like um, how much does the government spend, for example, in dealing with diabetics as an um, issue uh, on an annual basis, uh, and or perhaps the loss of um, economic output because of the disease? That kind of information would be very, be very helpful. Thank you. I think I can take that question. Um, there's a local study by the School of Public Health which showed that um, the annual 
um, healthcare spending, including productivity loss due to diabetes, is about close to one billion in 2014, if I'm not wrong. And with the doubling of diabetes prevalence, it's estimated to double to 1.8 billion by 2050. Uh, we know that simple, stable diabetes, it's not expensive to manage. It is the complications of diabetes that is costly to treat. Um, so things like end-stage kidney failure, uh, amputation, blindness, heart attack and strokes, these are the complications that drive up healthcare costs and spending. That, that is a huge drain on the healthcare system. So if we can manage uh, diabetes well in the primary care sector, manage blood sugar level well, they can continue to lead fulfilling lives and satisf satisfying lifestyles. And it's a um, very minimal sum of money to treat uh, simple diabetes. I hope that answers your question. Okay, I just want to respond with some ind indignation. I'm diabetic. Um, I have oral meds and I'm on insulin. Today, it seems like your war on diabetes tonight has become a war on pre-diabetes, which I kind of resent. Uh, I'm not fat. I've never been obese. I don't think I had a bad diet. So I don't want the implication on pre-diabetes to be you have diabetes because you're fat. You have diabetes because you ate poorly. You don't exercise. You don't walk enough. Um, the war on diabetes shouldn't be reduced to those things because the implication is that somebody has diabetes because they didn't take care of their pre-diabetes or they were lackadaisical in their lifestyle. And that's not true at all. Um, I'm very proactive. Even the water I'm drinking today happens to be a diabetes study. And I actually have apps on my phone that tell you what to do and when you should. So if you really have an initiative on a diabetes in Singapore, it shouldn't be where you guys are focusing now. Sure, you should tell people, I mean, the, the, the obvious thing is to say that you want to talk about diabetes, pre-diabetes, because it's the one that is only pre, pre easily preventable. But there are people like me who have never been fat, who've always exercised. By the way, I'm 53. So, yeah, you, you can be diabetic even though you have not much. Yeah, I, I mean, you're absolutely right, and I don't think anyone's disagreeing with you, but there, there's a, a focus here, and I'll, I'll let you take it first if you'd like. Well, uh, first of all, thank you very much for your feedback. I think that's why we call this a war on diabetes and not a war on obesity. Um, like I've shared earlier, family history and increased age are definitely risk factors for diabetes. We acknowledge that there are many diabetics because of family history. They have a genetic predisposition towards diabetes. And not all diabetics are necessarily overweight, like you have mentioned. And uh, we do see many diabetics taking very good control of the condition. Uh, but we are just concerned about that one third with which I've shared that uh, have poor control of their condition, uh, which we are worried which may lead to more complications. Um, so I acknowledge, so I acknowledge your feedback, um, but also I wanted to say that, uh, like I've shared earlier, that our future increases in diabetes prevalence will be largely driven by obesity, according to a local study and some of the mod modelling simulations which we have done, and that's why we are focusing a lot on obesity, not so that we are targeting obese persons per se, but we, we recognise that uh, we are well, we are Singaporeans, we love to eat, right? We, we, we have an uh, urban environment, urban lifestyle. Uh, we work long hours at the workplaces. I think Kenix has shared like close to 50% of us spend eight hours sitting. So uh, rest assured that we acknowledge your feedback. Um, I just think it's very naive to think that if you deal with pre-diabetes, it won't lead to diabetes because I, I really don't think there's a really strong um, so well, it's the, the third of the population that's at risk, and so it is f trying to focus on some of those that ca can make a difference. And so it, it's like in all things, it's about segmentation and trying to take different focuses. So if I may reference what's been done overseas in the US, in Finland, in the UK, for instance, there's very strong large cohort studies that show that lifestyle modification among those with impact glucose tolerance 
can significantly reduce the risk and can significantly reverse progression to uh, full-fledged diabetes. Um, so we are not trying to over-medicalize pre-diabetes and definitely it's not, uh, we, we are not trying to label people here, but we're just trying to say that this group of people represents an opportunity for us to intervene early to halt our increases in diabetes prevalences. Thank you. Okay, on this side of the room. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you, Kenix, for the nice presentation. My question is, one of the solutions you suggested was to link incentives to inculcate healthy behavior, I believe. Incentives, linking incentives to inculcate healthy behavior. So do you think this is an ideal long-term solution? Because what happens when the incentives are removed? Thank you. In the National Steps Challenge, like I mentioned, the incentives that were given out to, to people, it, for those who, of you who are familiar, we're giving out about like maybe $30 worth of NTUC vouchers. We, of course, we acknowledge the fact that monetary incentives may not be sustainable on a long-term basis. But what we are trying to achieve here is for those who are hesitant, for those who are thinking about doing exercise, being more active, but never got down to really doing it, the small incentives that we are offering gives you that extra little nudge, a little push for you to start doing something and to be more active. And hopefully throughout the challenge, which is usually about six months or so, a habit is formed. A habit is formed, a new interest is formed, you manage to find friends that you can do regular breeze walking sessions or even progressing to finish your first five kilometer run, for example. Way after the challenge where you carry on that active, uh, the, the habit uh, throughout, throughout the years, which is why apart from National Steps Challenge, we have a lot of other physical activity programs and avenues for people to continue sustaining their physical activity. So the incentives is the part that helps to start people off and form the habit later on. That's where we're coming from, yeah. Okay, th th thank you very much. What I'm going Can to I do... Can add oh, something? Sure. So even though we have been do experimenting with incentives, it's not the all and be all. So we are more than open to um, hearing from you other suggestions that you might have to just get people starting, uh, started. Okay, so I'm going to pause the questioning at the moment because I'm going to hand back to Derek who's going to take you through some of the elements of the challenge and then uh, we're going to get down to doing a little bit of work on the papers that you can see around the room, give you an opportunity to uh, work with your friends and colleagues and people you don't know here as we work up some of the observations, insights and ideas that you might have before we leave this evening. So please uh, join with me and thanking our panel for answering your questions. Yeah.